Good afternoon. My name is Alex Reich, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and to the sixth event of our monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent, objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. Our conversation today will be recorded and made available on this webpage tomorrow. If you'd like to ask questions, please submit them in the box below the video at any time, and we'll get to as many of them as possible in a dedicated question and answer period during the final 20 minutes of the event. We'd also appreciate your feedback on today's event and your ideas for future conversations, which I invite you to share after the event in the survey linked above the video. We won't be holding a Climate Conversations webinar in August, but we'll be back in September. And if you want to be notified about upcoming Climate Conversations, as well as other climate-related activities at the academies, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is also linked above. Today, we're going to talk about how climate change is impacting and exacerbating risks to security at home and abroad. And while there are many forms of security and many ways climate intersects with those forms, today's conversation will largely focus on how climate intersects with national security and international security. We're honored to be joined by Lisa Friedman, a veteran reporter on the New York Times Climate Desk, who focuses on climate and environmental policy in Washington, D.C., and who has covered nine international climate talks. Lisa will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, all of you, for, for joining us today. Um, I'm incredibly honored to moderate this panel on this important topic of climate insecurity. Um, President Biden, who has made climate change a, a core part of his agenda, has said climate change should be considered a key national security priority. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General recently told the UN Security Council that climate change is a crisis multiplier that has profound impl implications for international peace and stability. But what is, the, what is this concept of climate security? What does it really mean? What does studying it and creating policy to address it look like? How do we build capacity in the federal government and in academia and beyond? to research in this area? And, and how do we work with other countries to integrate climate change and security policy and responses? Um, I am lucky to have with me two of the smartest people in this space to answer some of these questions and to discuss this, this issue at large, uh, Swathi Viravali and Erin Sikorsky. Um, I'll just do brief uh, bio introductions for the, for the both of them. Erin Sikorsky is the Deputy Director of the Center for Climate and Security. She's also the Director of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Previously, she served as the Deputy Director of the Strategic Futures Group on the National Intelligence Council in the U.S., where, in, where she co-authored the Quadrennial Global Trends Report and also led the U.S. intelligence community's environmental and community security pardon me, climate security analysis. She's the founding chair of the Climate Security Advisory Council, a congressionally mandated group designated to facilitate coordination between the intelligence community and the US government scientific agencies. Swathi Viravali is a foreign service, uh, pardon me, foreign affairs specialist at the United States Africa Command. She is speaking with us today in her personal capacity and not on behalf of US Africa Command. Her background is in interdisciplinary research science with expertise in developing capabilities to assess how compound climate fragility risks threaten both the United States and global security. So let me just offer a brief reminder first, if you're joining us a little late, that we are reserving the last 20 minutes or so for your questions. So please feel free to send them in as we're having our conversation and, and we look forward to to getting to your questions as well. Um, Aaron, Swathi, we, we have a large audience today and I don't want to assume that everyone is conversant in, in first the basic concept of climate security. Um, when, when we're asked to conceptualize security, we tend to think of armed conflict, uh, maybe cyber threats, Kim Jong-un, Putin are the, the faces of, of security threats. What, what do we mean by 
climate security. Swathi, can I start with you? Yeah, all right. thank you for the question. I think that's a, it's a great framing question to begin our conversation. Um, so for, for my from my understanding, how I view climate security is I like to I, I, I'd like to frame it in sort of three different considerations, four different considerations. First, we have these overall trends that are occurring in the world right now. Um, we have empirical um, we have empirical evidence on how the earth is holding significantly more heat than before. Um, um, sadly, parts of the Amazon are no longer cap carbon sink. Um, and they're actually a, a carbon net emitter, which is a uh, really drastic. Um, we have uh, more, across more than half of the Earth's planet lands um, uh, over half of the la Earth's land surface. Um, the average annual temperature at night was at least a quarter of a degree more than that of days. So these trends are sort of tra these trends are concerning, alarming. Um, it's concerning and alarming. Um, so this, the second way I like to sort of unpack climate security is what you really are talking about the intersection of risk and risks and opportunities associated with these trends, right? So we have these trends, but we also have these risks and opportunities associated with these trends at different spatial and temporal scales. And what we're really concerned with are how do humans interact with their environment? How do humans interact with food, land, water at, at those specific scales? Um, and you really need a systems approach to be able to understand this. Thirdly, you really need to quantify and qualify what the unit of scale is. I think often when we're talking about climate security, there's an overall assumption that we're talking from a nation state perspective, but it's really imperative to remember that we're also talking about humans, so we're sort of at the very local level, and we're also talking about sort of global security. Um, so we really need to be clear about what the referent object of security is. Um, and we really need to use all three of those, I think, scales. And finally, um, I think for, from a climate security perspective, it really means that we we need to fundamentally change behavior now um, so that we can maximize opportunities and mitigate sort of future areas of, of risk in the in the future. Um, and we need to reframe sort of how climate climate change is actually being ex accelerated by political choices that we take today um, and how those subsequently cause conflict. So I think there's another assumption that, you know, climate is a linear, uh, you know, linear sort of leap to conflict. But I think if we unpack that a little bit, we need to we need to understand what the role of governance plays in that. And, and just to take a step back, and I'd like to do this for Aaron too in a moment, but, you know, tell me a little bit about, about your background specifically. How did you come to this issue of sort of studying the nexus of climate change and security? Um, what so brought you here? I think thanks, Lisa. Um, so I actually grew up in Botswana, um, and we, when we you know my family and I lived there, we lived there during a, sort of a 20 year drought. So water was very sort of, um, uh, important to say that to say the least we grew up very close to the landscape um and i unfortunately i'm not an engineer or a um and so when i when i wanted to go to school i, I knew i wanted to do something from an interdisciplinary perspective and so i actually was fortunate enough to find a master's that allowed me to examine water security from an interdisciplinary perspective um, and then during my work for the federal government you know, sort of now understanding how climate security specifically is the overarching framework by which all these other securities are sort of under under um, they underpin. Well, that's a that's a very personal under underlying you know driving force to understand these issues. Thank you, Erin. Tell us a little bit about how you view the issue of climate security, what it is, and and what you focus on. Sure. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thanks to the National Academies for having us. I love that Swati uh, used the word systems risk and systemic risk, because I think that's key to understanding uh, how to think about climate security. As you said, Lisa, in the beginning, for a long time, national security was very focused on states, right? What are other states going, what threats and risks do they pose to us here at home in the U.S. And then post 9-11, we moved to a world where, we're, OK, non-state actors are important too: terrorist groups, extremist groups, cyber threats, as you mentioned. Uh, and now really looking at climate change and after the past year of the pandemic, we've moved to a world that some folks call where we're really concerned about actorless risks, right? That there's no one individual or one state that's that's really uh, shaping this, but instead it's it's something that's fundamental to our entire environment. And I think the key here is in terms of how I think of it is, is that all of those intersect together, right? It's the actorless risks, it's the states, it's the non-state actors, and they're shaping 
the security environment. I come at this from the intelligence community where I led teams that were looking at security issues in the Middle East and East Africa. And time and again, as we tried to unpack why uh, security issues were such a problem in these regions, climate and environmental issues came up as a shaping force. And that to me led me to wanna really focus on these issues more not only in government, but then moving out of government and out of the intelligence community where you only usually study the problem, but get to a place where you can talk about solutions as well. Uh, so that's my uh, background in terms of where, where I'm coming from on these topics. So, so do you feel like you've seen the mainstream security and intelligence community shift in how they think about climate change and, and the threats that it poses, the security threats that it poses? Uh, I think it's an ongoing evolution, right? And I think, you know, this has been a topic of conversation in national security for quite a while now, especially within the Defense Department in the U.S., with a focus uh, for quite a while on the direct risks, right, that climate change poses to military and security forces, which I think are relatively straightforward. They're concerning, but they're easy to understand. It's the billions of dollars of damage at Air Force bases on the Gulf Coast when you have hurricanes or bases in California that have to be evacuated because of fires and attention turned from training missions to fighting those fires, for example. But I think there is a growing recognition now, and as you mentioned at the beginning, you're seeing this in the Biden administration, is it's it's not just those direct risks alone, it's how they intersect with other things and intersect with governance and corruption and instability and competition among states to really shape the environment. And I do think you're seeing, seeing a shift. You saw DNI Haynes speak at the World Leaders uh, Climate Summit that Biden hosted. You've seen other leaders like Secretary Austin uh, so I think the, the question now and the hard thing is how do you translate that leadership um, message on these issues down throughout the government to really change how we do business going forward? I think the phrase that a lot of us who, who cover these issues here uh, over the years is, is climate is a threat multiplier, right? That, that climate change is not necessarily driving the, the problems, but um, is exacerbating existing or underlying problems in, in, in many countries. I wonder, Swathi, if you could could maybe walk us through how some threats fit into the broader security landscape. If a, if a country is suffering from drought or crop failure or increasingly devastating wildfires, what what is the ripple effect? I mean, I think that is that is the question, right? So, what what are the ripple effects? And so, and I think we have some empirical evidence that sort of we we know at the at the national we have some evidence that sort of the subnational scale what things could happen. Um, but we we really need a, a better understanding of what's happening in, in various households. I think it, so at the very sort of at the local at the local level. Um, I think there's assumptions of what we think could happen. I know that water wars is a sort of a framing that people throw around a lot, um, and when when you um, when you look at the when you look at the history, actually, there's no you know there's sort of no proof of water wars actually happening. But um, that didn't happen in sort of the climate accelerated world that we live in today. Um, and so I, I just wanted to um, underscore something else that that Aaron said. I think we have the from the intel perspective, or at least from the from the national security perspective, we have a pretty good understanding of what those risks might be, right? Um, and but we now need to move on to sort of understanding what to do about it. Um, and, and so that, that sort of answers your the second the, your question more specifically, Lisa. What what, what is happening? Um, and again, we need we need social scientists to be able to tell us what is happening. At, you know, we have climate models that tell us sort of what these trends are saying, um, and we need to couple those with sort of social scientists to be able to understand sort of from the human security perspective what exactly is happening. And again, sort of what do we do about it? So, and, and, and this, you know, I think for either of you, I mean, before we dig into what do we do about it, I'm, I'm curious, do, do other countries think about the implications of, of climate security the same way that the United States is thinking about it in different ways? What, you know, how, how, are, how are other countries looking at, at this issue? Uh, maybe I can, we can get into, you know, it's a big question. Maybe we can. Sure. Zero you know, in the country. Yeah, I, it's been interesting to see the the evolution of of um, other countries looking at at climate as a 
security risk. Just in the past few weeks, actually, you had the Russians release their national security strategy. And for the first time, it had climate mentioned in it nine times. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting development. And Japan uh, this week released their defense white paper, which included climate change as a security threat, I believe, for the first time as well. So there's a growing recognition in other countries um, that that it's a security issue. There are some concerns, though, as well about what the so-called securitization, I think, of climate change and that making it a security issue um, makes it a defense issue. And then that that's problematic as well. But what I would argue is that recognizing that there are security risks related to climate change. If I could just pause oh, before. You sure, know, sure. Tell, explain why, you know, explain what this concern is. Why is there a concern about centering security? Um, on climate change? Sure. I think the concern in, in some cases stems from the fact that there's worry that then it becomes the Defense Department or military's job to fix the problem and that okay. you securitize it in such a way that is not going to be helpful to a lot of local communities and doesn't fully understand the range of justice issues that are related um, with, with some of these, these climate effects. I would argue that identifying it as a security risk doesn't mean that the answer is a security institution necessarily, right? And so you need all hands on deck to tackle these issues. Um, and I think there are ways around uh, that so that you're not creating it as, as only a problem for DOD, for example, in the U.S. to solve. And so I think, can, can you perhaps share more about, you know, other countries that are experiencing climate insecurity and and are there countries that, you know, that we can look to that are addressing it in a meaningful way? Yeah, yeah. so I think Japan just released their national um, national defense strategy and a part of it included, it, was, it had a climate focus on it. And I think globally, I would say writ large, there's a recognition that climate does sort of affect security and stability of those specific countries. And they're not wasting time on discussing the existential threat that it poses. Um, and I think globally, and I'm not giving you specific examples here yet, but um, I think people are more worried about resourcing it and understanding, again, sort of, I'm, I'm going to have a, a foot stomping this, um, what do we do about it? And I think that's the that's the question that, that countries are, are more concerned with. I, I'm here in Germany, and I think the EU just released a very ambitious um, sort of looking at decarbonization from, from the whole of EU perspective. And so I think the political will exists globally, and I think resourcing is, is is really the critical um, sort of next step. If I can jump into on another example that I think is worth highlighting is NATO. So NATO just released a climate, agreed to a climate uh, security action plan at their meeting in June. And it's a really ambitious document that lays out not only adaptation and resilience strategies, but also um, potential uh, uh, strategies around cutting emissions as well. Um, and I think that's a good recognition by NATO that these risks will affect their missions, right? They will affect NATO alliance members, whether it's an increase in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions, whether it's places where they have training missions like in Iraq, which faces sea level rise in Basra or drought in other parts of the country that will potentially lead to instability. And so uh, NATO, under the leadership of Secretary General Stoltenberg, has really stepped up. But that isn't, you know, we shouldn't discount the fact that there are differences of opinion within the alliance as well. And, and some of the uh, there are some political challenges associated with with pushing a strong climate security agenda. But they've really gone far in a way that I think other countries and other alliances and, and groupings of countries should look to. You know, I, I this isn't too sort of academic a question, but when we talk about climate security, do we think about What's being secured? For, for whom? By whom? <laughs> um, at what cost? What 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 do some of those the you know research into those questions look like? Yeah, so I think jump in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think I think that that's sort of what my my what how I'd like to unpack climate security, because if we don't understand the referent object of security, then we don't really know what we're securing. Right. Or who we're securing it for. Um, so I, I think it's it's a maybe a good time to sort of unpack what um, sort of what climate change means and what do, what do climate patterns mean? What is what are these sort of definitions? Because I think people talk about these. 
um, what climate security with that understanding without an understanding of sort of the time scales. So when we're talking about climate, we're talking about sort of a, an average of weather over about a 30, let's say at the decade, decadal perspective. And so at about 30 years, you've got a really good understanding of what weather is at the, what climate is at those, at those specific scales. When you're talking about climate variability, you're talking about how the weather fluctuates um, at a yearly um, below or, um, or above average um, at those specific scales. And so you're talking about seasons and then all the way maybe up to five years. Um, when you're talking about climate change, you're talking about long-term continuous change, right? And that's and that's expressed in sort of temperature, precipitation, et cetera, and wind, strong wind. Um, I think a professor of mine always used to say, climate is what you want, but weather is what is what you get. And and so when you're talking about so the referent object of security, I think it's important to go back to, you know, you really need to talk about from the nation, nation state perspective, but you're also talking about humans and you're also talking about sort of global yeah. security. And if you're not coupling those three like them and using the systemics approach that, you know, Aaron brought up earlier, then I think you're missing how, how we can become climate secure. I, I also think it's why some of the old ways of defining security and national security are, uh, no longer makes sense, right? We often in the security community, there's hard security issues and then there's soft security issues. And climate has long been considered soft, uh, the same with health security issues. But again, as we've seen with the pandemic and other things, what's actually killing people are, are these uh, are these risks. And so that 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 dichotomy doesn't doesn't make sense. And at the end of the day, the point of national security is keeping the people in your country and in your community safe. And uh, I think when we think about climate security, we need to think about people, as, as Swati said, not just the state level and, and, and keeping people in community safe by preventing conflict, preventing these climate risks from spilling over into greater instability and conflict. And that, that really needs to be the goal. This is, this is great. So we, we've touched on the ways that risks intersect and the importance of taking a systemic approach. I, I wanna bring this, into the implications for policy and planning. Um, you know, this is obviously a, a, a big issue now in the Biden administration. I don't think that we can talk though about what's happening in the government now related to climate security without discussing the last four years. Um, you know, it is no secret that President Trump was antagonistic to science of climate change. His national security advisor, Will Happer at one point, uh, was a prominent climate denialist who tried to censor congressional testimony on climate insecurity. Uh, he tried, uh, though was you know, not, not able to set up a panel to challenge government findings that set out the very argument that climate change is a security threat. Um, so, you know, maybe Aaron, we, we could start with you. What, what are the consequences of those last four years? Did things happen behind the scenes? quietly were was policy and and study in in the government on climate and security just at a standstill for for four years um where and where are we now sure no those are those are good questions i think a couple things i think that it's important to distinguish between the the political appointees and the civil service right and i think civil service throughout um, multiple administrations continues their, their work on the issue. But even, even prior to Trump, there wasn't a ton of focus within the security community on really mainstreaming climate across all agencies and across all work. And so certainly the Trump administration didn't help in that, in that case, but they weren't starting from a very high level necessarily anyway. Okay. Um, I, I also think, but I also think that Congress provided a nice push during the past four years on this issue where you saw bipartisan action on climate security, pushing the Defense Department and the intelligence community to continue taking these issues up. But I also think that one of the things that is challenging for the Biden administration is they have very high ambitions on these topics and they tasked a lot of things right out of the gate on climate change, but you, you didn't have the, the workforce necessarily in place to, to really go after everything right away. And so sustaining this for the long haul means building a workforce that is climate competent, right? From your GS-13 kind of mid, mid junior level employee throughout the national security community. And no matter what office you're working in, I mean, I've seen some reporter recently said that every reporter needs to be a climate reporter going forward because of how these issues are affecting everything. Well, I think every national security person within the government needs to be a climate person to a certain extent. And in so far as they can bring that into the work and their expertise that they do otherwise. 
Yeah, and I'm can either like of you? Yeah. Please. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. I add, um, that I think that this is this is a real problem for the climate security sector, right? Which is really all of us to to try and solve is really how to institutionalize it, because if you don't, I mean, we have the political will, right? And and as we saw with different administrations, you know that political will ebbs and, and ebbs and wanes. And if you are sort of are held um, held sus a suspect to that, then you're not able to sort of create behavior change. And, and that's why I think I completely agree with Aaron. Like if you're not, if you don't have the mid career, if you don't have those individuals um, talking about climate security, then you can't really motivate behavior change. So you can have the federal policy, but again, if you don't have that community of interest, um, you know, that vertical and, and horizontal integration. And, and so that that's sort of, if you don't have the institutionalization of climate change, climate security, um, then you have a real failure to be able to sort of adapt to what the future could could, could offer. Sorry, Lisa, back to you. No, no, no. That's, that's, I mean, I'd, I'd love to go in this direction. How do you bake this in so that it doesn't fall to the whims of, you know, changing administrations? I mean, it has to be more than just having the workforce, right? Because if the priority of an incoming administration says this is not important, then, then that, that message trickles down is there a, a good another good example in the government where something just you know ultimately became um you know it integrated and you know no matter no matter the no matter the politics of of an incoming administration yeah and I, so i think the pandemic is a great example of that because the, i think the pandemic was a great opportunity for us to sort of to, to really galvanize this, this behavioral change, right? We have an issue and we need an immediate response to it. And there was not, there was not, I mean, there was discussion sort of politically uh, whether or not we agree that it was a, it was an issue globally, but I think at the, at the very core, people realized how it, how it is going to affect the world globally. And so people sort of understood the threats and they understood sort of, and then they fig tried to figure out ways to deal with it. And that was sort of as a collective whole. And I think what we're missing here is this people are too caught up in the politics of understanding um, of, of climate. Um, climate security. So mm -hmm. like Aaron mentioned earlier, people are uh, very much against securitization of, of climate uh, because because you know they they don't want to make it sort of a, a military solution, um, and I think we're wasting too much time as a society as a, as a global society talking about sort of whether or not we agree that climate security is a threat, and less time sort of tr figuring out what to do about it. And so so I think the pandemic again was an opportunity where we all united to say, you know we got this vaccine in record time, right? Those those trials take a long, long time. And um, because of the cross-cutting nature of, of the threat, of the risk, we saw it as an opportunity to create these vaccines. And, and now I think mRNA is going to be used for other um, other um, diseases, right? And so I think, again, we can apply some of those lessons learned to the climate security spec um, sector. That's great. Erin, maybe could you, and this is, this is a question from a... Um, uh, from one of our attendees too. Could you kind of walk us through some of the big things that federal agencies are currently doing, whether it's at the Pentagon, state, you know, Homeland Security, um, uh, you know, USAID to address climate insecurity? Sure. Sure. So a lot of this came out of the, the Biden administration's executive order in late January on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Um, but the, the big things that were in there for the, the security agencies, first of all, we're, we're doing some research to understand the problem. So they tasked a national intelligence estimate, which is the premier report from the intelligence community. All 18 agencies come together to put out a report on topics that are mo of most concern to U.S. national security. And so they're working on that. There's a risk assessment report that the Pentagon is doing as well, that then they are supposed to integrate into the national defense strategy. Uh, war gaming and regional security planning going forward. Uh, State Department, USAID, Homeland Security are all supposed to be doing these things as well, uh, making sure that I think the executive order had some language around any any part of the government that operates abroad has to think about how climate change uh, intersects and shapes what what they're doing abroad. So every agency is doing that. And you've seen a lot of, of work at the, the Defense Department in particular has hired um, some folks into key positions in the office of the Secretary of Defense. 
uh, which I think is really important to have them there in that office as opposed to a separate office, right? But they re they report to the secretary um, and, and speak on behalf of his office um, to lead this effort in DOD. Uh, and you've also got, you know, obviously the special envoy, Secretary Kerry, uh, working on these issues as well. I think the, the piece that Kerry seems most focused on is the mitigation, obviously the cutting emissions part, which is important, obviously, in the second half of the century in particular for security. But we also need to make sure we're focused on the adaptation and resilience side, I would argue, um, because even if you cut all emissions tomorrow, we still have security problems we've, we've bought. So uh, I think there's more work to be done there, frankly. Yeah, and I just want to add really briefly to that. Um, I think we have we have the federal policy, right? And that's coming down, that's, that's trickling down. But I think um, from my perspective, we still are not obligating enough resources against it. And I'm not just talking about financial capital, I'm, I'm talking about sort of human resources. So uh, it's great that Se Secretary Kerry is, is the climate um, sort of global, uh, our State Department's climate czar, right? That's his unofficial title. Um, but again, like Aaron said, we need those mid-career people to start talking about these issues um, and, and having some some actual um, pro, uh, um, what do you call it? program uh, descriptions, job descriptions that are uh, that are at our level so we can start sort of trickling those um, down. And I think that's when you start, if you do that, then we can really successfully operationalize climate security. And um, and that's, and what right. I mean <laughs> yes, please. Wait, how do we get from I mean, we have a lot of studies out there and these are critical, um, but like how how do we turn this into operationalization? Yeah, and I'm, I, I don't have a, a great answer to that because I think that I, I want to throw it back out to our listeners and 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 throw it back to our federal researchers and and um, other scientists and researchers out there because I think this is where we have a real opportunity to define what does operationalization mean. Um, so Aaron spoke about the NATO's National Climate Action Plan, and what I think what the, what's missing in the action plan is sort of how do you operationalize so. How do, how do countries actually start beginning to plan for the effects of climate change? And I think that's a very important question and we don't really have a good understanding of that um, because it requires, again, like I, I'm coming back to it, uh, obligating human resources, obligating financial resources to this. Um, because at the end of the day, again, you're talking about behavior change and how do you get federal policy to motivate behavior change? I think, you know, I think that's where we're, that's the space that we're in now. And that's what I think we want to be able to answer. Let me pause for a moment to just remind our audience that, uh, you know, we're getting in a lot of great questions. I encourage you to send in your questions. I'm, I've already incorporated a few and, and, and we're going to um, start bringing in more of your questions in, in just a few minutes. So thank you for, for sending all of these and please keep them coming. Erin, did I, did I cut you off? Oh, you're, you're fine. I was just going to jump in on how do we, how do we operationalize this? And I think there are a few things we can we can look at here that might be helpful. Uh, one is the the UN and the UN Security Council has now um, climate advisors uh, uh, positions within some missions abroad, including in Somalia, for example. They have someone whose job it is to be the, the climate security advisor there. I think that's one model you can look at of like having a person on the ground with a team who's who's got that background and that experience. Um, there's an effort by an organization we work with at, at the Center for Climate and Security, Klingendal Institute in the Netherlands, which did a study earlier this year on climate security practices. It was part of our World Climate and Security Report this year, and they evaluated uh, interventions around the world that had a climate security focus. Uh, there aren't a lot of them, <laughs> and that's why it's not called the best practices report. It's just called the practices report um, because it was just looking at, at these nascent um interventions. And I think that's something we can look at as doing that research to kind of understand how these, these practices work. Uh, and then the third thing I'll say, and I had a, um, I, I think there's, we need to give uh, the work of the national security community the right tools to use in their day-to-day -day work, right? To be able to integrate this hard science with the social science, as, as Swati said. And so, you know, there are, there are great predictive capabilities associated with understanding uh, climate change and climate effects and finding ways to get those tools in the hands of people who need to use them within the, the national security community, I think would, would help as well to institutionalize and build that culture. Right. It's about building culture and, and shaping the bureaucracy in such a way that it just becomes in ingrained into the work um, going forward. 
Yeah, and so I, I you describe, I, I'm Sorry. just curious, how would you describe the culture now and its attitude toward the intelligence community, the security community, and its attitude toward climate as a security threat? From, from my perspective, I think there's it's still very siloed, right? You still have the climate folks are separate from the regional folks, and you don't have that that systems integration that you would need. I think at some senior levels too, you still have folks who are fairly skeptical that climate change is really a security problem. That yeah, maybe we should collect some secret information about what adversaries are going to bring to the negotiating table, but other than that, not leave it to the scientists. I do think that's changing. I think you see a new generation of folks coming in who automatically understand just kind of intuitively why climate change is a security issue. But I think you need to make that that change to more senior levels of management. And I, I will say again, what I've seen from DNI Haynes so far, she clearly gets it. Um, and so I think that's really important. But uh, but there's it'll it'll take time. It's an evolution. So I think maybe given your ro role with Africom. Where do you see the opportunities to advance climate security and, and what, you know, maybe you could speak a little more about some of the resources that, that are needed and what allies and, and partners um, should, we, should we be working with? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really great question. And I actually was spending some time um, beforehand sort of thinking of, of how best to do that. Um, my mentor is often fond of saying, you know, when you're talking about um, strategies and developing the correct right strategies, you, you want to do the right things. There's doing the right things and then there's doing things right. Um, and, and so there's some tension there, I think, in the federal government right now where we're not quite quite there yet. Um, so one of my, um, my former coworkers and I were talking about sort of from the Department of Defense perspective, what does success look like? How do you, how do you, you know, how do we get to, how do we become climate secured? And so one of the conversations uh, revolved around sort of .mil PF, which is, um, which is sort of a, a framing um, tool that the, the sort of joint doctrine um, uses to, to basically look at sort of from a strategic perspective, what, what are the issues that um, we need to better understand? And so if we have, and .mil PF stands for a doctrine, I have to look at my notes, organization, training, material, uh, lead um, leadership and um, personnel, as well as facilities. And so if we have climate security at each of those levels, then I think, um, you know, then there's some opportunities to really advance climate security, um, not just within the federal space, but it's sort of in the um, in the civil in the civil sector. That's great. I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience, and one question we have that I'm 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 so glad to see is on climate migration. Um, uh, one audience member asks, "Isn't climate migration the most significant security risk? Potentially hundreds of millions moving out of uninhabitable areas." Um, I, I want to just. Add to that, you know, I understand that, that President Biden has requested a study on, on climate-induced migration. Um, an international rights group, Refugees International, just this week came out with a report uh, urging the United States to accept millions of what, what they describe as refugees who will be forced to flee the effects of climate change. So, um, you know, let, let's, let's open this up. At what point will the United States and other countries have to develop policies to specifically address people who are displaced uh, in part because of climate fuel disasters. I can start on that. I mean, they should start developing those policies now, <laughs> I think. Uh, but are there but, any? Do we have any? Yeah. Uh, well, that was what the executive order was was going towards. Right is is to do the study and then and then implement some policies. But I want to take a step back to talk about how climate change shapes migration a little bit because I think that's mm -hmm. important to the under the understanding. And there are two primary mm -hmm. pathways, right? There's the acute events, right? When you have a hurricane or a typhoon and everyone has to flee, uh, and then there's the slow onset stresses as well, where over time land becomes environmentally degraded, uh, so you can't grow crops there anymore. Maybe your the river becomes, uh, land around it becomes salinated because of sea level rise. And over time, it's, it's much a slower process. Most climate migration that we see and will see will be within states and not between states to begin, right? It's people moving from rural areas to urban areas. Um, and so, and, and that's, I think, important to understand. And then obviously then there is the potential for movements um, outside of states across borders 
And that's clearly what the United States and, and others are concerned about. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that that's, it, it, it'll be a, a process that happens over a long period of time. And we, if we start planning and thinking about it now, we have time to address the issues, um, but it's it's super complicated as well. And it's not just climate change, it's climate change mixing with a lot of other things that causes people to leave their countries eventually. It's governance, it's corruption, it's other security issues. Uh, it's not just climate change alone. And, and yeah. am I right in understanding, both of you, that, um, you know, to my understanding, the bulk of what we call climate-induced migration is happening internally. It's not, it's not really so much um, you know, people fleeing one country for another, but fleeing the Shatkira district of, of Bangladesh, for example, for Dhaka. Um, how, you know, I see both of you nodding. Um, that, I mean, let's just say that that problem is gets a lot less attention. It's not as sexy, right, as, <laughs> oh, Australia is going to be, you know, swarmed with people fleeing their homeland um how and it, and it becomes a really localized problem how do you generate the needed attention for that as a security issue as a human security problem I, yeah i, I, I don't want to flip that question because i think people often rely upon this sort of there's going to be mass migration because of climate like climate security and that's sort of used as a sort of galvanizing you know a sort of us versus them and and i think my our friends over at usaid would remind us that migration requires access to resources and it, it's it's people of a certain socioeconomic level that are able to to get on that boat right or to get um to to, to be able to move whether it's from rural to urban and i think we actually need to be more concerned about the people who cannot migrate Rate, um, who are forced to stay in a location because they don't have adaptive capacity and adaptive capacity is the ability to cope with change um, because they don't have any money, right, or access to resources. And so I think that that's, I, I think we, we need to be more concerned with sort of what is globally, what is our adaptive capacity, absorptive, I'm sorry, adaptive capacity ability to change at various levels. Um, we did some research um, a couple of years ago and one of our researchers from South Africa found that when you're sort of comparing and contrasting the adaptive capacity of individuals from Mississippi and um, from a certain location in Sudan, I can't remember the town, um, that in, in Sudan, actually, you had a higher adaptive capacity because you know, the people that they were talking about had access to weapons and they had, you know, their, <laughs> their livestock. Um, but people in Mississippi were sort of reliant on, were reliant upon, um, this was in Greenville, reliant upon institutions to bail them out. So there's a perception that sort of in the global north that these institutions are going to bail you out. But, you know, you're, there's sort of that time lag from when the disaster occurs, whether it's slow or sudden, to then actually getting you uh, the ability to, to to sort of get out of that situation. Um, but people that are actually more mobile may be more adaptive, right? So I think we we need more, uh, a better understanding of what what causes people to stay. That That's fascinating. So if I can stick with you, Swati, for, for a moment, um, because this is related, one of our one of our audience members asks, you know, the impacts of climate change are highly localized, but how do you make a meaningful connection between national security and the local level? Um, you're all, you know, can we stick on that point for a moment? Yeah, and I think that's that's why we, we want to talk about sort of uh, using a human security or human human security lens because it brings it back to the individual. Um, and I think there's there's a very great definition of human security, which I, I'm not going to recall right now, but it actually, uh, and, um, I think a part of the definition involves word dignity, um, right? And, and so when you're talking about these long-term effects, um, long, longitudinal impacts of what changing climate patterns could have upon societies, um, understanding again, what's happening in those households is gonna be critical because people um, have the ability to deal with some, some type of change right now. But again, when you start overlaying sort of like in Yemen, agricultural issues along with water scarcity issues, the, the capacity to cope with the incremental um, in the incremental capacity to cope with change becomes a lot smaller. Okay, Aaron, um, you know, again from our audience, over one one of our audience members asks: Over the next decade, how should strategic planning within the military and intelligence communities integrate climate risk into the suite of traditional risks? 
that are considered, like state actors, non-state actors, China, Russia? What, what does that implementation hopefully look sure. like? Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think, I mean, there's a couple of things I would point to. One, I would point to the, the Global Trends uh, report, which I worked on when I was on the NIC and they released in, in March. I thought they did a really nice job of laying out what they called kind of fundamental risks, which climate was one of four. There was also a, a few others there, technology, economics, and de demography, I think. And then, so those are the things that are fairly certain over the next 10 to 20 years. You can project fairly carefully. Uh, or fairly fairly uh, well what's going to happen. But then as Swati said, it's how humans interact with those trends, right? And so, and that's where you get the uncertainty going forward. And so I would I would argue that that how you how you integrate climate, and then we've used this word a lot, is a lens, a climate lens onto whatever national security problem you're looking at otherwise. How does climate shape? that how does it shape an, another actor's uh, ability to operate in the environment how does it shape their decision making i think china is a key example here so often especially on capitol hill you see hear this question of like well is it climate or is it china that's more important and if we focus on climate we can't focus on china and uh that's just the wrong question uh, a colleague of mine john conger had a recent op-ed in defense one on this that was excellent but it's you need to bring climate into the China conversation. You need to understand how climate change is shaping uh, Chinese leaders' decision making, right? And how it's shaping their ability to operate in the Indo-Pacific, how it's shaping countries we want to ally and partner with in that region, and what are their main concerns, and how do we help them with their climate concerns in such a way that perhaps helps us in competition with China. I mean, there's all these kinds of ways you can bring it in, and I think that's how it has to work going forward to make sure we don't miss things because otherwise we're gonna if we don't bring that climate lens you're totally gonna miss uh key risks and threats to the u.s yeah um this is a very specific question swati don't be don't be scared by the beginning of it if you haven't read the nato climate change and security action plan because our audience member points to point four of that plan but uh the point four of that plan uh our, our audience member notes uh, mentions that it's expected that there will be a disproportionate impact on women and other populations. Um, can can you expand on what our audience member described as the differential impact? How how does climate change affect the most vulnerable communities, um, women and 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 others in a disproportionate way? And and how do we have to think about that in the cl climate security context? Yeah, I think that that's a great question, and and there's there's a lot of you know great research out there, and and um, so with with without trying to do undue diligence to them, I think um, right now I I would argue that women carry a, a lot of um, different burdens in the world, and I'm being I'm, I'm being pretty obtuse here, but when you're talking about sort of at the at the household level, right, we were talking about before, um, there's sort of what the socioeconomic, like you, you have these socioeconomic duties that you can, right, you have jobs and, and et cetera, but you also sort of the, have the invisible chores, right? You have to manage um, sort of what, where you're, not you have to, but women tend to be the managers of these invisible, the, the, what they call the invisible burden. So um, has your child been vaccinated yet? Um, you, do you have to schedule these doctor's appointments? And so, so already I think women are, are, are pretty stressed. Um, working um, in this sort of in, in this in this space. And then when you overlay these impacts of, of, of climate change in across the world, um, I think you're going to see again, I, I agree with the question, I think there's going to be an undue amount of um, disproportionate amount of stress on women because they're already stressed right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in, here, here's here's an interesting question that that uh, maybe maybe Aaron you can you can take. Do you have any potential concerns, for example, um, or examples that come to mind about state non-actors leveraging information about projected climate resilience or vulnerability for strategic gains? For example, restricting access to resilient resilience building resources or even limiting access to the information needed to build resilience between actors, like withholding information about future impact projections to affect investments, et cetera. Um, is that, is that a, a, a concern, Aaron? 
Um, did, it, did it say non-state actors or? It does say non-state actors, but I, I imagine this would, this would, uh, you know, extend to, to state sure. actors as well. Sure. Um, state or not? Yeah. I yeah. I mean, I think that could that could be a concern, right? That 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 bad actors try and limit amounts of information or not share how bad they might think things are with for themselves, for example. Um, I, that probably fall, falls lower on my list of, of major concerns around climate security going forward. But I do, it does relate a little bit to a, when I usually lay out my, my, my baskets of climate security risk I, I'm concerned about, I, I do worry a little bit sometimes about the risks of response to climate change creating security issues. And the, the simple one here is the energy transition, right? There are going to be winners and losers as we move away from fossil fuels, and that can create potential instability and unrest in places that have relied on on fossil fuels for their economy and, and social stability. But there are also concerns that some interventions in developing countries, for example, could be problematic around climate security if you don't understand the actual players on the ground. Um, you've also seen some governments uh, a little bit, you know, use, you, use climate change as an excuse for poor environmental practices, right, or environmental degradation. Oh, it's not our fault that you don't have water. It's it's um, climate change, which we didn't have anything to do with. And and um, or I, I even worry a little bit. You know, having been someone who followed counterterrorism issues for a long time, you saw many states try and use counterterrorism as a reason to partner with the U.S. against groups they didn't like in their own country. Um, could the climate security lens be applied that way, right? Like, oh, we need your help to deal with this issue, but we're going to exclude this group from it. Uh, so, I mean, I, again, that, that's a concern, but I think it's minimal compared to other other concerns. Okay, so, uh, you know, obviously in, in addressing anything, there's there's unintended consequences and, and maybe this falls into that basket. Are, are, there, are there, you know, other unintended consequences of addressing climate security? Thought, hey, that that are on your radar. Um, I, I don't think I, I, I don't think so because I, for me, I see climate security as sort of the overarching, sort of the, the umbrella of you know where where you put the basket of of risks and everything sort of trickles down from that. So, I think um, we we did a study a while ago looking at the return on investment um, on you know if you if you try to take action um, you know climate security action, um, what does that yield you in the future? And I know that the the the, the building council in the in the U.S. also did, looked at that and. You know, I think the numbers just are just they don't lie. I mean, you just you see a return on investment, or so you have sort of a dual. What you do now is going to yield sort of many positive effects in the future, right? So if you build climate resilient buildings now that can withstand, um, you know, future disasters, then and some of those some of those benefits you can't quantify all the time. You you you, uh, you need to qualify those, and and I think it's um, yeah, you can't go wrong with that. And, and just to, to but, clarify, yeah. I think absolutely yeah. there are, oh, sorry. Let me just, that's okay. We, we have five minutes left. And I just, I have a question that I love that I, I want to, <laughs> uh, so, so say there's a student in social sciences and humanities who's thinking about joining government service, possibly in the intelligence community. Could, could each of you give some of the three biggest areas of, of climate change that, that you'd recommend they study to prepare for, you know, this, this duty to be environmentally informed in government service? Yeah, I think, I think in the government, we need more science-based policy and policy-based science. And I, I think Aaron and I have talked about the needing a systemics approach um, or a systems approach really. And so, and I think that you, you, if you can get a program that offers you sort of multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary look at some of these um, issues that we're talking about, and then, then I think you'll have great success because, you know, I've worked a lot with engineers and I've worked a lot with social scientists and, and it's hard sometimes to, to marry or integrate those communities of interest together. But, um, mm -hmm. the great success was when we had, um, researchers who had that sort of transdisciplinary background. Um, the, my, my former coworker was a, she's a, she was a teacher and then was a certified engineer and now is a social scientist. And, the perspectives that she brings to 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 the table are just phenomenal, you know. And so that's what I would you know recommend is trying to get that, try to get as many, um, try to get a holistic as a, a approach as a possible. 
I yeah. love that. Erin, what about you? No, absolutely. I think interdisciplinary approaches, I think people who can act as translators, right? That's what I think about it. It's someone who can bridge the gap between the, the scientific community and the social science community or the national security community and help the two kind of communicate and collaborate uh, is, is critical. And so in terms of, of substantive areas to focus on, I would focus on what you're most passionate and interested about, but then think about how to, how to build that ability to talk across uh, groups and also the systemic risk and systems thinking. Um, any kind of coursework or work you can do in that approach, I think would be really useful as well. So, so as a final question from me, um, you know, what is the one thing you would like our audience to take away from today's conversation? Erin, let's, let's start with you. I think the thing I would say is that there's not a single current national security concern of the U.S. that's not affected in some way by the climate crisis, and that there are opportunities, however, uh, to address these issues that will have co-benefits, right? So if we address the climate issues, we will also then address many of these national security concerns. And so thinking about it from an opportunity perspective and not just a risk perspective is, is critical uh, in, the, in the years to come. Oh, that's interesting. Swati? Yeah, I think Aaron read my notes because that's uh, literally, <laughs> literally the same answer I had. Um, yeah. I, I will just add that I think there's a perception that um, there's, you know, that climate trends are dire. But like Aaron said, we have opportunities to get this right. Um, so can we look at the most marginalized communities now and, and get it right now for them so that in the future, um, they're they're more adaptive um, to to future change. So, and I think that people often view vulnerability from a negative perspective, right? So, if you're very vulnerable, that's that's not a good thing. But I think, again, I think that's where you have the most opportunities to get things right. Um, and when people talk about resilience, I think people talk about it as a, as a sort of a finished concept. So I am resilient and you sort of check the box and it's like, okay, well now I'm climate resilient. And that, that doesn't, it doesn't take into the, to the conversation, the, the dynamic nature of climate change. Right. And so we don't want to be static. We don't want to have these static responses or static answers. And so that's why I think vulnerability is a, is a better or more useful lens because you're constantly evolving um, and looking at different ways that you can make yourselves less vulnerable. Wonderful. Swati, Erin, I, I really want to thank both of you for an incredibly thoughtful conversation. And I want to thank everybody who, who attended and uh, uh, sent in questions for an, an absolutely terrific conversation. I'm gonna turn this back over to Alex, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you for your fantastic moderation today and for the depth of expertise and thoughtfulness you brought to your questions. I also wanna thank Swati and Eric for sharing your expertise and your perspectives and your time as well. Um, and also thanks for your leadership in this area in general. Uh, thank you again to all of you at home or at work for joining the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine for our sixth climate conversation and for asking such excellent questions. The conversation was recorded and should be available for viewing on this same webpage starting tomorrow. Again, we'll be taking a break for August, but we'll return with more climate conversations in the fall. And you can sign up for the Climate at the National Academies newsletter above to get notified about upcoming climate conversations as well as other events. As a final reminder to share your feedback on today's event or your ideas for future events, please see the survey link above. We really appreciate hearing from you. Lastly, thank you to the climate communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's events. We're excited to continue the conversation through future events like this, and I hope you have a good one. Thanks so much.